Good morning and thank you for joining us here at an expectant Buckingham Palace on this defining day for King and for country. A day of coronation and celebration. In just under two hours' time, King Charles and Queen Camilla will ride from here in the Diamond Jubilee State Coach to be crowned at Westminster Abbey in a service laced with ancient legacy and studded with symbolism. Thousands of members of His Majesty's Armed Forces are preparing to escort him to and from the Abbey. Already in place, of course, are the first of thousands of well-wishers lining the processional route. Some have been camping out for days, hoping to catch a glimpse of the King as his gilded convoy passes by. Charles will be the 40th monarch to be crowned at the Abbey, the latest in a lineage reaching back to 1066, but in a service with Charles' own contemporary twists. It will be a moment that confirms the King's contract with the people as he is called to serve them and in the religious part of the ceremony to serve God. At the heart of today is the moment that St Edward's crown will be placed on the King's head. It is a replica of the original, which is said to date back to Edward the Confessor and was melted down after the Civil War, only to be remade at the Restoration by Charles II. Today, it will be placed on the head of Charles III. Later, his return journey to the palace will be in the gold state coach, part of a mile-long procession back through the ceremonial heart of London. The day will end with salute and fly past and, of course, an appearance in front of the crowds on the famous balcony of Buckingham Palace just behind us here. You will not miss a thing if you stay with us today. Over the centuries, it has been an eventful few hours. William the Conqueror's service triggered a riot. King John laughed through his. The young Richard II slept through his. They have sometimes been lavish, always long, frequently shambolic. But there is every chance the new king's pared-down service today will run like clockwork because that is the modern tradition. Many coronation service guests have already arrived at the Abbey, some taking their seats from 7.30 this morning. And Mary is just by the west door where the king and the queen will enter the Abbey later. Mary, whether you think this is all absolutely tremendous or somewhat strange or every shade in between, there is quite a day ahead. There certainly is, Tom, and excitement is running high. I've been watching people walking in the, the Great West Door and they look magnificent and they look really excited. Today is about history, it's about continuity, but it's also about looking forward, a combination of ancient and modern. At the very heart of it, this place, Westminster Abbey, the centre of national sorrow and celebration for more than a thousand years. The wedding of the now Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, of course, in 2011. The funerals of George V, George VI, Princess Diana, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and just a few months ago, of course, Queen Elizabeth II, after 70 momentous years. Now, the Abbey is also this nation's coronation church since 1066, as you said. Charles, the 40th monarch to be crowned here and much of what we witness today will be informed by history and tradition the pageantry the ceremony the symbolism the regalia but also some new elements too at the insistence of the new king to reflect modern britain a more diverse inclusive britain showcased alongside the centuries-old pomp and circumstance a shorter service a third as many guests as in 1953 fewer dukes and earls lords and ladies less velvet and ermine no coronets in the congregation and a reflection within the church of england service of our modern multi-faith society that's changed of course so much since queen elizabeth herself was crowned present will be an array of foreign royalty many of them relatives of our own royal family together with world leaders commonwealth dignitaries and every living prime minister past and present and some famous faces that will be pretty familiar to all of us, I think, from the world of entertainment, fashion, the arts, sport and beyond. But actually, most of the 2,300 gathered inside the Abbey today are people that you won't recognise. Charity workers, NHS staff, military veterans, 
everyday heroes who have contributed to this country's greater good. Individuals who connect the king to the causes he holds so dear, the environment, youth opportunities, community. It is going to be a colourful and memorable couple of hours and I will be here to guide you through who's who, what's going on and what to expect. And alongside me is Royal Editor Chris Shipp. So an awful lot is going to be happening today. What is it all about, Chris? Do you know, look, we, what we're going to see here today is an ancient ceremony. It's full of religious significance and historical significance. And in fact, a lot of the things that are going to happen uh, in there are traditions that will be familiar to the king's forebears. But I, th I think not without some justification. People might ask today, why? Why are we doing all this, given that he's been king uh, since the moment of his mother's death uh, uh, last September? And the answer is that every single king and queen regnant that's come before him has done this. As you were saying, William the Conqueror had his uh, coronation in here in 1066. And even before that, we can go back to some of the things that they will do today relates to King Edgar in 973 AD at Bath Abbey. So look, the history is here. This is what kings do. There's, there's, there's him pledging his oath to the people, if you like. And also there's the Act of Parliament, the coronation oath that he will give. That's the one part of the service which is about the law rather than, than about uh, religion I itself. But whatever else, it's going to be a spectacle today. We're going to see something quite magical. They say it's going to be pared back, but it's going to be pretty glittering, isn't it, nonetheless? <laughs> I don't think anyone watching this today will think, hey, this looks a bit slimmed down. It won't <laughs> look slimmed down at all. You know, the moment that the king and queen come out of the door there and get into the Gold State carriage, it'll be so long, more than a mile long, that the front of it will already be halfway down the mile. Uh, none of it's going to look slimmed down, but we keep being told that this is mixing tradition with the modern things like you'll have female bishops for the first time, etc., and a lot fewer people. Don't forget, Queen Elizabeth had 8,000 people in there today, as you were just saying, just over 2,000. And a last-minute change to the, to the order of service. Yes, we've spoken a little bit about this homage of the people. It's been a little bit uh, controversial. Uh, the church has, and the palace as well, has been telling us, look, it's an invitation uh, rather than a command. Uh, we note the wording has been slightly changed to invite people to pay homage to the king if they so wish. But it's the one bit of the whole service that's been a little bit controversial in the last few days. OK, lots more to talk about. Plenty of time to do so for the moment, Chris. Thank you. Julie. And we'll be keeping a close eye on all those arrivals at the Abbey this morning. A few notable faces already. We saw Emma Thompson. We've seen uh, Dame Judy Dench, Lord Simon Woolley also taking their place. Uh, thousands of invited members of the public will also be watching the procession from a grandstand on the opposite side of Buckingham Palace. We can see them from our spot here. And Nina Hussain is there too. Nina. Just look at the uh, stupendous view that has been afforded to the invited guests here at this uh, specially built grandstand for this uh, incredible day that we've got in store. From here, these people will witness history on a grand scale, but up close and personal on arguably what is the country's most famous stage. So who is here? Well, Estimates say around 300 million people are watching the coronation unfold around the world, but no estimate, 3,800 people have been invited here. They've been given a golden ticket because of the work they do or have done in service to the public. The British Legion has invited some thousand veterans taking part to watch as the armed forces new commander celebrates his big day. Alongside them, hundreds of workers from the NHS. NHS, give me a cheer, please. Hundreds of workers from the NHS and from the social care sector in here, in part to be thanked for the incredible, relentless hard work, especially during the pandemic. Everyone was under strict instruction to arrive here early this morning and, and try to get seated and settled by 8.30. As you can probably see, uh, a spl splattering of red, white and blue, but also they are dressed for every eventuality, I guess, that the British weather could throw at us today, come rain, shine or even thunderstorm. 
What treats have they got in store? Well, uh, they will be the very first, I think, to uh, get a glimpse of the king as he departs Buckingham Palace as part of the king's procession then after that key service at Westminster Abbey. Their majesties will return to the palace during the coronation procession. What a sight to behold. And as you mentioned, of course, the big moment that everyone along the Mall is waiting for, the moment when the newly crowned king steps out onto the balcony, morning, flanked by some of the key members here. of the royal family. Sure then it will be all eyes to the sky and all fingers and toes firmly crossed that the historic flypast does indeed get the go-ahead and get lift-off. But whatever happens today, I'm sure we'll get a grand day out here on the grandstand. I don't doubt it for a minute, Nina. Thank you very much for that. We'll be back to you later. While the vast majority of people will watch the coronation on TV, more than 2,200 people have a seat in the Abbey. We saw a few of them a little earlier. They range from royals and dignitaries from all around the world to celebrities, community and charity workers. And Charlene White will be speaking to some of them outside the Abbey. And Charlene, invites extended for all sorts of reasons. Well, yes, the, the, the king was very adamant that he wanted normal people represented here, not just uh, lords, ladies, dignitaries, world leaders, but, but people also who just do great things. So therefore, there's several, and yeah, I'm sort of trying to be very professional about it, but yes, Anton Decker right. here. You can't, you can't get more normal than this. Yeah. The, these two guys, you might, you might recognise them. Now, you're here because of the Prince's Trust. You've yeah. been working with them for well over 20 years, and you are ambassadors. How much does it mean to you both to be here? Oh, we're over the moon to be invited. And because of our relationship with the Prince's Trust, you know, we hosted the awards, we've got our own course that we've run with the Prince's Trust, the Making a Media course. It is a privilege, an honour and a privilege to be here today. And uh, how does it feel when you realise you were getting invited? It's quite surreal. It's really surreal. I mean, you know, when the invite comes through and it's quite an ornate invite and it comes through the door and you think, hang on a minute, is it finally our time to get wound up? Is somebody having us on here? Because this is a really good wind up. And not, it apparently it, it was true. And here we are. It's a very <laughs> elaborate wind up. It's, it's, a very, their own it's also a very expensive wind up. Yeah. Um, but the Prince's Trust has helped over a million young people mm. turn their lives around over the last few years. That's quite a legacy for the king to have left, isn't it? That's the best legacy for him to leave, I think. You know, he started the Prince's Trust with his Navy pension uh, back in 1976. And since then, yeah, it's grown. The, the, the Prince's Trust has grown every year and it's now worldwide. And uh, like we say, you know, we're, we're just very proud to be part of it. And we can see now firsthand how it does help young people in this country and in, around the world. And also, what's lovely to see is how passionate he is about it. Mm. He really does care about it. It was his idea. It's Look exciting. at that. It's, it's like being, we're in London, guys. Look at that. Um, it's, he's really passionate about it. You know, he put his Navy pension into it. He wanted to give young people who weren't in employment, education or training or had any real options. He wanted to give them options and give them opportunities. And that's what he's done. And now here we are 40 years later and over a million people helped. It's, it, it's a heck of a legacy. And you, you're talking about this with also an extra bit of knowledge because you guys worked with him with, when he did a big sleepover at Dumfries House. <laughs> we did. Well, yeah, yeah, we did. <laughs> he, he didn't call it that, funnily enough. Fancy <laughs> we, a sleepover at my gaff. <laughs> We call it that. No, we did a documentary did, yeah. with him. We followed him around for the best part of a year, uh, for 40 years of the Prince's Trust, to have kind of a year in his life. Uh, and it was fascinating. And one of, one of the parts of it was he invited us up to Dumfries House to see the work he's done there. And we, and we were going to stay over. And we thought we'd be in a wing somewhere down the, down the end of the estate. And we got there, we got inside, and our bedrooms were next door to his. So we were literally in the next door bedroom, which meant we had to keep the noise down a bit. Not that we're noisy. Uh, I walked out the door at one well, yeah, point. Yeah, you, you had an encounter with him on yeah, the stairs. Yeah, I walked out and I thought, well, it's not like we're going to bum into him. And I walked out of the door and he was there with a pair of saccateurs. And I was like, <laughs> hi. And he's, hi. And then he goes, one finds that it's always better best if one prunes the roses oneself, <laughs> don't you find? I went, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, we had no idea we were going to be next door. Yeah. So uh, that was quite a, quite a surreal night. But yeah, it's it's incredible. We've had, we've had a fantastic uh, time working with the Princess Trust. And like we say now, three years ago, we started our own course with them, the Making It in Media course to give young people uh, a start in the media industry. So we're very proud of that as well also. Now, talking of surreal moments, how surreal is it going to be for, for you both when you walk through that door? Because as I said, there's going to be world leaders, uh, a huge foreign politicians, uh, you've got dignitaries, lords and ladies, and then Ant and Dec. I, <laughs> I mean, it feels like a slight dig every time she says <laughs> It's, it's, it's payback for the jungle, I find. Uh, yeah. um, do you know what? I've been watching all the coverage all week leading up to it, especially last night, and just to be there, to, to be part of it, and to say for the rest of your life that you're a part of history is a wonderful thing. So we're just proud, over the moon. And also, Inch we're beam. hoping to recruit for the next series of I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here and see if we can get a few. <laughs> yeah, there'll be a few ex-Prime Ministers I can you, think you, of. You can, you can give a, a good word as well, Charlie. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure everybody would be well up for that. Um, <laughs> I think we're doing I'm gonna, show in South Africa at the moment. I think my time with... have people from I'm a Celebrity from the past come back and do it again. My time with you is definitely oh, done. Oh, that's a shame. Um, but thank you so much, thank Alan Deck. Thank much. you. Now, guests are still uh, arriving. They are waiting of course uh, for the king to leave where you are both uh, Julie and Tom at Buckingham Palace and he'll be leaving at about 10.15 or so so, so there's a lot of anticipation here Tom I have to say <laughs> I, mean, I did not expect uh, today there we are Lionel Richie uh, after the slightly surreal business of having Ant and Deck talk us through their sleepover at the palace definitely a turn I did not expect today to take so early but here we are Lionel Richie of course uh, a legend one should say, who is uh, performing at the King's Coronation concert, uh, right in the centre of frame there. We've had Sadiq Khan, I think that's just on the right of frame. We've just seen come in uh, various celebrities, as Julie was referring, Emma Thompson's already in, Judy Dench, Maggie Smith. Uh, we've also seen Chris Whitty, uh, Sir Chris Whitty. He won't have forgotten <laughs> from the dark uh, days of COVID, um, but one of the many representatives of people doing voluntary work, public work, charity work um, of all types. So the Abbey slowly filling up, still waiting, of course, for the leaders of the realms, former prime ministers, the cabinet, foreign royalty, and then, of course, at the end, our own royal family. So the King and Queen will leave Buckingham Palace in the next hour in a small procession to travel to Westminster Abbey for the service. We will be here until 3 p.m. to watch this moment in history from our studio right outside Buckingham Palace. As you can see, <laughs> it's going to be sunny. <laughs> Feel it. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by a range of guests all through the day. But first in the studio, our royal historian, Anna Whitelock. If you've been watching any of these programmes in recent years, you'll have seen her many times, and author and columnist Satnam Sangera, author of the best-selling Empire Land. Wonderful to have you both here, not least because there's sort of a work of explanation to be done today. Anna, perhaps to you first. Um, Chris was talking about some of the ancient ritual that we'll see unfold within the service itself, but just take us through what we need to be looking out for and what we need to understand. There's a lot to look out for and there's a lot to try and understand um at the key point of course is uh the crowning and if you're watching at home it's 12 o'clock that is the moment where the king gets to wear the crown and and in a sense if you ask any small child to draw a picture of a king or a queen they draw a picture with a crown on and that's actually quite deliberate because the crowning signifies that you've got the job you've become king and that's really what we're seeing today we're seeing the invisible made visible the fact that he's king being articulated and declared and we have this moment of crowning and we've referred back to William the Conqueror um, as the first monarch to be crowned at Westminster Abbey and he so contested was his uh, accession Battle of Hastings we might all remember that he needed to be crowned for him to become king so he had to get to this day really really important Later, we know that, of course, monarchs can extend the throne on the death of their, the heir, and this then just becomes a more ceremonial moment. But before the crowning moment, there are, they, you know, the, we, we are going to be walked through several stages, aren't we, including the recognition, the oath, the anointing, where 
the, the uh, King Charles III will be screened from view, a very private, sacred moment. There is a sort of course of events that will be charting all the way up to that moment of coronation. Exactly. It is like a kind of play, and this is a piece of theatre as much as it is a sort of constitutional moment and a religious one. So the king will arrive and, yeah, the recognition. And basically, the congregation will be asked to recognise him as king. Again, it's that being seen to be believed. Do you take this man to be your king? It's almost this sense of a wedding we're seeing today between the monarch and his people. And then from uh, the recognition, we move to uh, the oath. And the oath is really important. It's the bit that actually has to happen, the coronation oath. It's odd, and we can talk about it a bit more, because it really only makes sense if you were in the 17th century when we felt the sort of threat of Catholic Europe. It's Protestant. The king has to promise to uphold the Protestant church. He has to then promise to be a Protestant. All quite problematic in the, the multi-faith age that we live today. And it's only after the oath and then the anointing, this very special uh, moment where oil is placed on the monarch, he will be screened. But again, really important to emphasise that spiritual, sacramental part of uh, the ceremony, and then finally the crowning. But we should also remember that, of course, he is becoming uh, well, crowned as king of the United Kingdom, but also, of course, he is king of countries around the world. So king of Jamaica, it's the coronation of the king of Jamaica today. It's the coronation of the king of New Zealand today. So we need to be really aware of that, the fact that we are uh, performing here something that means something, and of course it's a contested meaning now. The countries across the Caribbean in particular are making decisions as we speak about their future. Barbados became a republic just 18 months ago. So a number of countries here uh, that Charles, in that coronation oath, it will be referred to as the realms, that he promises to uphold the laws in those realms. Well, actually the number of realms is arguably going to be diminishing all the time. Satnam, if you... Just hearing Anna talk about that, we're talking about a service that has very specific origins at various points in our history. We're just saying the oath kind of from that uh, period when so much was contested. How do you... Britain's a totally different country today. It's a multicultural society, for one thing, which, as Anna said, the king is trying to reflect, but it's a very restrictive, very specific service. How do we make sense of that? Yeah, for me, this is a very imperial occasion. I mean, even the background here... These, these elements of the, of the pageantry aren't actually that old. I mean, the, the facade of Buckingham Palace, the Victoria Memorial, the Mall, these were things that were built in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, at the height of empire, to make London a more competitive imperial city. And then you've got the slickness of the event. I mean, it's only when Queen Victoria got made Empress of, of India in 1877 that things got more professional. I mean, Queen Victoria's uh, coronation famously was unrehearsed, quite chaotic, the clergy lost their place, the ring didn't fit on the finger. But everything had to get more serious when the crown began to represent the biggest empire in human history. But today, you're going to see all sorts of things that go back to empire. All the Commonwealth leaders, and the Commonwealth exists because of empire, and the sheer multiculturalism of the event is a reflection of the fact that we have a multicultural society which reflects the fact that we had a very multicultural empire. I guess that gives the crown something of a problem, though, doesn't it? Mm. A days like today, is it reflecting that past or moving on from that past? And do you think, how do you think the crown should approach that, and the king in particular? Yeah, the crown is very complicated. It no longer represents the huge empire. It represents the Commonwealth, and there's questions about what the Commonwealth is for. It represents the Commonwealth realms. And there's lots of countries that no longer want to be Commonwealth realms with the king as the head of state. And it also represents a multicultural society, which is facing all sorts of awkward questions about loot, imperial loot, and about slavery. OK, well, we're just looking at, uh, in the Abbey, Andrew Lloyd Webber, the centre of frame there, uh, of course, has made a composition for today, um, just chatting to Lionel Richie before both of them going to take their seats. Worth um, mentioning too, we saw the cabinet beginning to arrive just a few moments ago, Tom, whilst we were listening to Satna and we're, there's uh, jo Joanna Lumley, Lumley, Dame Joanna. Uh, a little earlier we saw the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, and also the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. So it is one day for people spotting. It is. It is. <laughs> 
Certainly is a whole church absolutely <laughs> packed full of familiar faces. Now, after the service, a huge military procession will lead the newly crowned king and queen back to Buckingham Palace, where they will appear on the balcony behind us for a coronation fly pass. If the weather holds. More than 60 military aircraft are involved, including, of course, the Red Arrows. And Rachel Younger is at RAF Waddington, where they are preparing and watching the clouds intently. Rachel. Yes, good morning, Tom. They certainly are, given the weather forecast, because everything right now depends on the level of cloud cover, particularly over the capital. Now, there's nothing they can do, of course, about that. But what they can control, they have done to perfection. We know, don't we, how spectacular these fast jets look in the skies. But I can tell you they are equally magnificent on the ground. And as you might expect, over the past few days, polished to absolute perfection. Now, if the weather gods smile and everything crossed, they do, then this will be a historic moment for the Red Arrows too. And that's because they were only formed in the 60s. So although we've seen them many times, haven't we, flying over the palace for celebrations like the Jubilees, this will be their first ever coronation fly pass. And one of the people who has been preparing so assiduously on the ground is Flight Lieutenant Jack de Schoolmeister. Now, these are not new planes, are they? They were built in the 80s, so it must be a real labour of love keeping them so immaculate. Yeah, absolutely, and, uh, you know, we've got the right team here, and it just goes to show that um, with the right care, the right attention to detail and, you know, polishing the jets, servicing the jets and doing the scheduled maintenance that we can keep even the older set of aircraft in the sky safely. Now, you were kind enough yesterday to give us a bit of a peek under the canopy at the cockpit themselves, and I have to say I was really surprised by how few computer screens are in there. It was more like looking inside the interior of a classic sports car. Yeah, they are very old, and unlike some of the newer aircraft we have uh, these days, which when they land, you know, they'll tell the engineer uh, what's wrong with them. We're relying on the, the skill of the technician and uh, in detail technical analysis of the aircraft just to pick up any faults and uh, obviously maintain them as best as we can. And we've come round to the back of the jet here because this is where the magic happens, that moment we all wait for when the red, white and blue streams from the rear of the jets. But just getting those coronation colours perfect is a job in itself. It is, yeah, and that's why we've got a dedicated team called the Dye Team on the Red Arrows and it's their job to make sure that the right diesel and uh, dye mixture goes into the right chambers at the right time uh, to ensure then when the pilot presses that button that the right colour comes out the back at the right time. Well, Flight Lieutenant, I know you are quite up against it at the moment. Thank you for explaining that to us. For those of you who cannot be in the capital but would really like to catch a glimpse of the red arrows in the skies, I can tell you that they're due to take off at 10 to 2. They will then fly across the Lincolnshire countryside towards the North Sea. They will cling to the East Anglian coast, keeping their feet wet, as they say, until they get to Norwich. Then they will turn across Essex, which is where they will join up with the 50 or so other planes in the formation. The Red Arrows at the back, the man in charge of making sure they are inch perfect, Red One or squadron leader Tom Bold. Hello to you, Tom. Hello. Really tense time for you, I know. But also, you've done this before, haven't you, a few times? I have. I've been very fortunate. I've flown over the Monarch six times uh, and this is my final year leading the team. So to be able to do it in front of the king for the coronation will be extra special for me. Yeah, completely unique moment for you. What is it like when you fly down the Mall and over the palace? Do you manage to get a glimpse at the crowds on the ground? All right, well, the whole team will be concentrating on what we're doing at the time. They'll be concentrating on formating, making sure they're in the right place at the right time. Uh, I might just have a little cheeky look down at the palace, see what's going on at the time. Uh, but everyone else in the team won't get that sense of enormity, enormity until after they've landed. Uh, we're very fortunate in this team that we get to fly the Union flag wherever we go. So today it'll be extra special to put that red, white and blue smoke over, out over the palace. Yeah, and I know from speaking to members of your team how keen everybody is to get up into the air today. I've seen you looking at the sky a few times. It doesn't look bad here in Lincolnshire, but what are the parameters that you will need to fly today? Yeah, so the whole fly pass will be a thousand feet. Uh, so we need the cloud base to just be above that. Uh, and right now the forecast is, is on those limits. Uh, so we will get airborne, uh, we'll go down to the hold, and then we will make those weather calls right up until the point where we're due to be over the top of the palace. So you will be on the phone to the meteorologists even in the last few moments? We will, yeah, we will leave the decision right till the last minute because it's the British weather and you never know what's going to happen. Well, we have everything crossed for you. We really do. Desperately keen, as you hear, to take to the skies. I don't know, Tom and Julie, can you give us that all-important update on exactly what's happening there in the capital? 
Well, it's a little overcast, but there's a bit of brightness just behind us here. So we're keeping everything crossed to uh, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, joining us alongside uh, Satnam and Anna here in our studios, Mylene Class, musician, broadcaster. You perform for the, for the King, Mylene. Uh, we're just waiting for the music to begin in the Abbey. Um, and this is a really important part of that. Just briefly, give us a sense of what you're excited about. Well, what is so exciting about this is imagine you finally get the chance to listen to King Charles's playlist. <laughs> he has very acutely curated, with the help of music advisors, the exact uh, concert orchestras that he wanted to invite for, for many years to perform, the pieces that he has a real affiliation with, just his favorite songs, all the way from Bach through to modern pieces. This is the first time at any coronation that we were going to hear a mixture of classical music, the world of music, theatre, film composers, uh, there's even a gospel choir. Let's listen to the music which is just beginning now. Just hearing some of the preparations for that uh, music, which is going to be there for people to listen and contemplate their surroundings uh, whilst they're listening to it, just before it begins. Uh, Mylin, what will people in the Abbey be hearing first? Well, what is really interesting, the fact that you said we're hearing the music, we're not seeing it, and that is because most of the orchestra is up in the triforium. So these are the rafters. Uh, it's almost like being sort of stuck in a corridor. So they've had to actually put special rehearsals together in order to be able to cram. There's nearly 200 musicians in the Abbey at the moment. So there's some very clever arrangements of it that have had to take place to be able to encapsulate the full breadth of how these pieces were initially written. What you're about to to hear uh, now uh, for the next 20 minutes or so is the Monteverdi Choir and you're going to see their conductor. Now Sir John Elliot Gardner is a very good friend of <laughs> King Charles. They've got a common interest in music uh, and also agriculture. So Sir John Elliot Gardner, he's actually a farmer and when he was knighted by King Charles, King Charles said to him, um, thank you for the heifers. He <laughs> gifted him two heifers uh, for his 60th birthday. So they've got a very close relationship and friendship. <laughs> and uh, what is so beautiful about this music, it's our introduction to the first pieces that we're going to hear at the Abbey, chosen by King Charles, and it's Bach. So very traditional, uh, probably the oldest hymns that you're going to ever hear uh, uh, about Mary uh, and uh, Christian music. So a very interesting uh, way to start the proceedings. And many musicians like to begin their day with Bach, I believe. Because well, he's the granddaddy. He
or Mylene the first uh, of uh, many wonderful pieces of music. is our first sight of the king and queen today on this huge day just leaving Clarence house where they're still living to make the very short journey down the mount of Buckingham Palace the first grand sight of many along the mall this morning Greeting from the King on his coronation day 
to the crowds who've been camped out along this route as a few raindrops begin to fall. And uh, very shortly, we'll see this uh, the cars emerge behind us here. This is the beginning of many significant journeys on this day of days for King Charles, making his way back through Buckingham Palace gates from which they will emerge a little later this morning in the Diamond Jubilee State Coach for the first procession. Let's just take these pictures in as the King and Queen return to Buckingham Palace. So we're watching now uh, alongside the crowds that you can see on the uh, galleries below us there, just in the left-hand uh, shot of your screen, those who got that first glimpse to like us to see the King and Queen uh, travel from Clarence House to Buckingham Palace. And I think uh, Nina was there and saw it all unfold there too, Nina. Yeah, I did, and so did the crowds, but actually uh, it was so unexpected that even though I was trying to point it out to people, I don't think they really realised what was going on. It was earlier than expected and not what was expected. So as soon as they did realise this was indeed the King and Queen, a cheer went up in the grandstand. But I am expecting much, much louder scenes when the King's procession begins a little later. Thank you, Nina. Yes, uh, we see you've got your uh, umbrella to hand. A few drops of rain uh, pouring uh, now on the Mall. And uh, here in the studio, too, we saw the King uh, pass by around the Queen Victoria Memorial into uh, Buckingham Palace. There'll be lots more to see from here. Lots more to see, too, at the Abbey, of course. And Mary and Chris have got a great view from there, Mary. We really do, Julie. We're feeling very lucky. I'm joined by historian, royal author Hugo Vickers. Join me and Chris Shipp, our royal editor this morning. And we are seeing people arriving all the time now. And there was a very, very interesting arrival just now, which was the chief rabbi, wasn't it, Chris? Chief rabbi walking here. And incidentally, a very interesting story there is that the king allowed him to stay last night at Clarence House. We've just seen the king come from Clarence House because, of course, it's the Sabbath and therefore he was unable to get here any other way other than by foot. So the king allowed him to have one of his presumably many bedrooms at uh, Clarence House last night and he's just arrived here in front of the Abbey. Just walked in to totally alone and, uh, and a, a demonstration, isn't it, of the multi-faith nature of this service. Hugo. Very much so, yes. I mean, we've seen all sorts of things. We've seen a lot of diversity within the Abbey, people sitting there. We've also seen the peers in their parliamentary robes. We saw a fantastic procession of, of officers of arms, that's the heralds coming by with... Um, Lady Manning and Buller is dressed in the Order of the Garter, one or two regalia peers as well. Um, Baroness Benjamin, I saw her, for example. Um, so, yes, it's a, great, it's a great mixture. It's fantastic. It really is. And we're talking, aren't we, about this, this uh, combination of ancient and modern. What are you most looking forward to seeing, Hugo? Well, I mean, it's such an amazing day, if you think about it. I mean, the king, in the course of this two-hour service, he will be recognised, he will be anointed, consecrated, crowned, enthroned and blessed. That's a lot to take on. I mean, he will come out of it a different man than he went in. He will, it is the culmination of everything it means for him to be our king. And he has waited longer than any other heir in our history. He has, so he's had plenty of time to think about it. And I think, as we've already seen, one of the things he's been thinking about is the music. I mean, he's a, the music is partly traditional and partly new. He's commissioned 12 new pieces, as you know, but also we'll get Zadol Caprice, we'll get I Was Glad, and it's going to be a fantastic performance, apart from anything else. And looking at the congregation now, looking at John Elliott Gardner, and everyone looks like they're enjoying it. It's a real sort of feast for the senses, isn't it? It is, and I think anyone who has been invited has, it feels very special, especially because there's only 2,000 people this time instead of 8,000 last time. So it's 
it's a you know it's quite a special invitation. It's a pretty select bunch. However, never mind if you haven't been invited because we're here to talk you through it, and uh, it's better than being there. That's what we're saying. Well, Mary, it? some people haven't been invited, of course, are those who don't like the monarchy. And we've got a little yeah, bit yeah. of news uh, this morning that there is a protest going on, and this is something that we have grown used to, perhaps under this uh, this monarch that we didn't see as much under the previous uh, monarch, the late Queen, uh, and the Republic group who clearly wants a republic and an elected head of state have a protest at uh, um, Trafalgar Square and this morning uh, their chief executive a chap called Graham Smith and five other members of the team have been um, arrested by the Metropolitan Police and of course we heard from the police earlier uh, in the week didn't we that they would have a very low threshold when it came to protest there is a big protest um, uh, at Trafalgar Square and the news this morning that five of those protesters have so far been arrested okay thank you Chris uh, the other news it is raining here at Westminster Abbey not too hard so far but we may be bringing our umbrellas out and also I've just been handed this which is the actual order of service beautifully printed on creamy paper and everything that we're going to see throughout there uh, so we will tell you a little bit more about that when we've had a chance to read it through Tom Mary thank you very much indeed well uh, as we said uh, the King and the Queen left Clarence House, where they still uh, live a little earlier than we expected, to make the journey to Buckingham Palace uh, in order to get ready to take part in the procession and that will take them ultimately to the Abbey. Now, you'll see as they come out here, a huge number of people have turned out all along the Mall. But I think also evident when we see these pictures, uh, particularly when we move away just from that close up of the King and the Queen waving to the wider shot. The enormity of the security operation today, the public are not lining the entire route. They're not around Trafalgar Square, for example, not around Parliament Square, I think because of the difficulties of the security operation. Uh, and as Chris was saying, we've just had the news that the head of Republic was arrested apparently for unloading placards. And maybe that's a good moment to bring that back into the studio and have a little chat about that. I mean, Anna, we, this is a very difficult balance. Everyone's got a strike, right? If you've spent hours queuing, you don't really want your day to be ruined by, you know, protesters. On the other hand, we are a democracy. People have the right to protest. People are quite uncomfortable about these quite draconian new laws. Where's the balance, do you think? <laughs> That's a big question. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think it was sorry. certainly, I mean, a coronation day is really about, we talked about this kind of contract between the monarch and the people, but it's about the two engaging. There's a kind of dialogue. Um, and if we think back to centuries past, there would be a much longer uh, procession on the eve of the coronation through from the east of London, all through with, with pageants lining the route where people would communicate messages of aspiration, of hope to the new monarch, what they hoped that he would you know, be true to and, and would champion. And so I think we need to kind of get away from this kind of very strict sense of it has to be absolutely perfect and be a bit real about this. And this is about, yes, absolutely, we have a, a constitutional monarchy, we have a democracy, and actually the monarchy needs to be part of the cut and thrust of that. And so I think, you know, we wouldn't really want to see, would we, just cheering crowds when we know as a country that many people, if not entirely opposed to the monarchy, do have questions about exactly what the crown represents now. And I think the symbol of the crown which when we talked about William the Conqueror, it genuinely was a contested crown. There were other heirs. Now I think it's a contested crown, but in a very different way. What it represents, who's it for, is it inclusive, what's its future? I think it's also interesting to note, and we should just touch on some of the images that we're seeing now along a slightly damp mile, it has to be said, um, that you know, it is about also not only an understanding of a crown, Satnam, but a personal understanding of who the current monarch is, the personality, the character, the presence of that person uh, mattered enormously under Queen Elizabeth II, uh, not least purely because of the length of that reign of the span of the history that she, she covered. Yeah, I mean, a friend of mine who organises Indian weddings call this uh, a low-key event. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it is low-key. It's low-key compared to 1953. It's low-key compared to the coronation events we saw in India, which had you know, 100,000 tents, which went on for a month. But also, it's quite a troubled occasion. I think there's really profound questions being raised about how equal we are as a society. And the entire event has been overshadowed by controversies to do with empire. I mean, one of the first things the organizers did was make clear they weren't going to use a Kohinoor diamond. 
And then it turns out they're using a South African diamond, which is also contested. And then King Charles has said all sorts of things about sorrow in relation to slavery and so on. But we've had 12 Commonwealth nations issuing a statement saying it's not enough. So it's pretty troubled. And, and it's really interesting, isn't it? Because one of the things that one reads about in the run to an event like this is that coronations are always evolving. They always evolve to try to reflect and enter that new contract that you described, Anna. And we've seen even, just in the last few hours, a tweak to that moment of public homage that has been one of the slight controversies this week. Absolutely. I mean, different coronations have sort of different ordinances, sort of different order orders, as it were, that would sort of set up what the ceremony looked like. And Yes, so much stays the same. And we keep talking about, you know, going back to 973 or 1066. But then there are different inflection points and by different changes of emphasis, things that are omitted, and we can see that today, um, reflecting changing society. So interpretations involve, even if the ceremony stay the same. But yes, this question about the homage of the people. And of course, in many ways, it may well have been a kind of, you know, it, something got lost in communication and, you know, it wasn't the intent to order people to do it. But such is the contested nature of the times that people see that as some kind of order and it really kind of ignites this sense of injustice because it's about inequality, about the sense of obedience to an allegiance to one man. And when we, you know, when we think about all of this today, it's all about one man who's there, not by anything he's done, but by simply that he was born into a white privileged family. And today, literally, the whole eyes of the country and the world are on him. Obviously, watching the scenes in the Abbey, we're about uh, to see, I think, some of the military forces who will be deployed today to uh, escort the processions beyond the processions. And there we are, uh, the first of them moving out. We'll have Bill Cubitt, our military commentator, as the day progresses to tell you uh, exactly um, who we're seeing and why. But let's for a moment just soak up the atmosphere as they emerge. There we are, first sight of the some of the 10,000 or so troops who will be from all the services who will be deployed in various uh, forms today. And I can I just bring you in here? We, we we often talk on days like today. We remind ourselves that the armed forces swear allegiance to the crown, not uh, Parliament. Although in the complex web and weave of our constitution, uh, one, one might argue about that. We t we talked earlier about how in many ways how prescriptive and restrictive what's going to happen today is. But one bit that does strike me as crucially important is the oath to observe and govern by the laws. 
I mean, can we just talk through the exact kind of democratic points of the service and why they may still matter, why they do still matter? So the bit that really matters and the bit that has to happen was laid down by Act of Parliament, and it is the coronation oath. But it's the coronation oath which, although it's changed over time in terms of who you include, whether we were talking about the United Kingdom or Britain with the Commonwealth, with realms, essentially it dates to 1688, so after the Glorious Revolution, and when William and Mary, William of Orange and Mary were invited to become the Protestant monarchs. And basically Parliament said, you know, we'll have you, but we need to be really sure that you're going to uphold the laws. And up until that point, over the centuries, the coronation oath that had evolved basically said we'll, the monarch would uphold the laws and customs of the people. And Parliament were like, mm, it's a bit too vague. We just need to really nail this one because the first Charles didn't really play by the rules. So they made it very, very clear it was the laws as established in Parliament. So Charles today will promise to uphold the laws and established um, in Parliament in the United Kingdom, but also the laws in the other realms. And this really does, again, make it very clear that he isn't simply head of state in the United Kingdom. It is also in those 14 other realms. And one of the changes that has been made to the coronation oath this year, this time, is rather than list those realms, they're just being referred to collectively. Now, you might just say, is that sort of hedging their bets? Because it's this is such a kind of changing uh, situation. You know, Barbados broke with... Uh, becoming a Commonwealth realm last year. So we just mentioned them collectively. But it is the bit that matters, him upholding the laws of uh, Parliament. Let's listen in to some of the sounds and take in some of the sights here on the map. As I said a little earlier, right beside us in the studio here is Bill Cubitt, our distinguished military commentator. You will have seen many times before. Bill, can you just... Yes, the route from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey will be lined by about 2,000 troops from all three services, plus uniformed civilian services, Royal British Legion standard bearers. And this, th these detachments are now marching out from Wellington Barracks. And we're looking here at detachments of foot guards. They're the Grenadier Guards. 
moving into position where around the Queen Victoria Memorial they will be at two paces apart, which is much closer than normal, and then five paces along the rest of the route. So it will be the foot guards on the Mall up to Admiralty Arch, where the Royal Navy will then take up the route lining duty, and then the Royal Marines, the uniformed civilian services, and then round to the uh, Royal British Legion standard bearers representing military charities. We're looking here at the band of the Royal Marines. All these detachments are marched into place by musical units, so either bands or corps of drums. The Royal Marine bands are the bands of the Royal Navy, of course. And worth noting uh, on this occasion, Bill, the procession route goes beneath Admiralty Arch. It's quite a difficult manoeuvre, isn't it? What we're going to witness from these many thousands of troops today. Yes, it's, it's got a corner to turn, which is never easy in marching detachments. But it, it won't be as difficult as going under Horse Guards Arch because the Gold State carriage doesn't fit <laughs> under that arch. So that's why they're going uh, through Admiralty Arch. They'll use all three arches, um, as you can see there. It's Edward VII's memorial to his mother, Queen Victoria. Uh, put there in 1913, designed by Sir, uh, Sir Aston Webb. Uh, the Royal Marine Band will remain at Admiralty Arch uh, during the procession and provide the music in that area. Also, there will be 200 uh, uniformed cadets seated at Admiralty Arch watching the parade. Uh, this is uh, Charles I on the right, as they were in. Uh, Trafalgar Square, south edge of Trafalgar Square. And this, if you like, is part of the corner down into Whitehall, where the route then goes down to Parliament Square and the Abbey. These are Royal Marines in their pith helmets. And we should mention the police, of course, who are outside then. So the armed forces have got 10,000 people involved, while the Metropolitan Police have got 30,000 people involved. It is a quite astonishing level of security around this route, isn't it? And, and it is for the King and the Queen, of course, but also thousands of troops who are going to be out on parade today. Yes, we're going to see the main parade, which is the one on the way back, is 4,000 troops uh, marching, which is about twice the size of the uh, Queen Elizabeth's funeral procession. So it's, it's very big, this. And the point is that it there are detachments from every part of the whole armed forces, which is, really hasn't been done in my lifetime, I don't think. As you can see, it's uh, started to rain fairly hard out there, which doesn't make things any easier. Bill, one of the things we note, we've been talking with Anna about, is the precision of these occasions. You know, it's sort of developed over the years to this sort of absolutely like clockwork thing. But these are big processions today. If you're the person in charge of it, how do you make sure it all runs perfectly to time? Well, rehearsal, of course, is the key thing. And they did a big rehearsal at RAF Odium, where miraculously the runways are the right lengths for the these two roads, uh, so they have practiced it. They're using technology a bit more this time, so the parade will be started off over the radio because obviously no sergeant major's voice can be loud enough to carry a mile. So um, this will be done uh, over the radio to the marshals who will then do it to their detachments who are next to them. And of course, a great deal of work has gone on by each service and by each unit uh, to get this right. But it's very demanding. And we're seeing the street liners deploy here. Of course, their duty is to remain in place on that route for three hours. Uh, now, they won't literally stand there for three hours because provision has been made uh, during the service for them to thin out into rest areas and then come back on. But it's a very demanding thing to do. Some rather soggy was, uniforms too. Say, yeah, so I mean, the wet, when you're soaking wet. The wet weather plan it? is yeah. to get wet. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very clear. Very clear, simple. Very military. Plan. Everyone will follow that. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's one of the regimental colours of the foot guards, uh, who, which will be along the route. The king's colours will all be in the procession, and the uh, the. the sovereign standard of the uh, King's Company of the Grenadier Guards will be in the Abbey. Thank you for the moment, Bill. Let's uh, take you back to the Abbey and uh, Mary can tell us what she can see from there. Hi, Mary. Hi, Julie. We're just picking up on what uh, William Cubitt was saying about the precision of these occasions. And I don't know if you can see behind me, but just by the Great West Gate, where all of the dignitaries are going to arrive shortly, there are lots of very smartly dressed gentlemen there, all of them looking at their watches, uh, constantly glancing at their watches uh, to make sure everything is running 
particularly and perfectly to time. Chris. Yes, and Bill was just talking about the wet weather plan. We've got our own wet weather plan here, which was to inch forward a little bit <laughs> underneath the um, canopy because um, I was getting wetter than um, you. Uh, listen, we are waiting uh, now for the arrival of uh, lots of heads of state. 9.30 is the point at which uh, they are all arriving at the, uh, the west door of uh, the Abbey here. And then around about 10 o'clock, we've got the faith leaders, um, all eyes, of course, on the palace. We saw the, the, the king and queen uh, just now arriving at the palace. The next time we see them, we'll be at 10.20, precisely for that 33-minute journey here in the Diamond Jubilee State Carriage. Oh, now that's Oliana Zelenska, isn't it? Who's just gone in through the Great West door. Of course, uh, the First Lady. Yes, and she had um, uh, oh, there was a photograph uh, last night of her with the First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, for the, re the reception that they had um, at Buckingham Palace. With the Princess, uh, with of, the Wales. Princess of Wales. Yes. Quite some power. Oh, and there's Prince Andrew. And well, OK. Where do we start? Um, Over to you, Chris. <laughs> let's, let's talk about Prince Andrew. And actually, let's listen to see if there's any reaction in the crowd as he. As he drives down the mouth. There are arguably a couple of elephants in this rather magnificent room today. One of them might be Andrew, the other might be Harry, correct? OK, let's be clear, uh, neither Prince Andrew nor Prince Harry are currently working members of the royal family. OK, they're still in the uh, line of succession, uh, but neither of them will take part in, in terms of the King's procession here, in terms of the coronation procession back to Buckingham Palace, nor uh, on the balcony. But both are going to be present, of course, for Prince Harry, it's his uh, father, for Prince Andrew, um, his brother. Uh, Prince Harry arrived here uh, in the UK yesterday from America. We know that he's coming alone, not with Meghan. She uh, remains in California, where today happens also to be the fourth birthday for Prince Archie, as he's now known, because he's a grandchild of the reigning uh, monarch. And Prince Harry will be seated, we believe, a three rows back in the Abbey. So Significant. Well, not on the Arguably. front row. OK, not front row. All right. So we are seeing now some more arrivals coming in through the dry way. Um, and we're going to be seeing the arrival of Commonwealth leaders, aren't we, who are all going to be displaying their national flags and so on, which should be quite a magnificent sight. Yes, and I think um, for, for, you know, look at, look, at, look at that view. I mean, it's an absolutely uh, stunning setting for uh, this coronation. You're seeing there the nave through to the choir, and it's on the other side of the choir that you've got this coronation theatre, as it's known, where right now is that uh, coronation chair, the St Edward's chair, waiting for the arrival of the king. We were talking about differences between today and 1953, Hugo. One very great similarity is the weather. It was pouring in 1953, wasn't it? Well, it was, and let's hope it doesn't do that exactly the same this time. Um, I think there's a bit more optimism. It's just sort of hovering, but there's still people arriving. There's still a sort of, a kind of sort of lull here a little bit. You know, we've got some street liners. Um, the west door is completely sort of uh, empty, waiting for special people to come to it. Um, other people, I think, have gone round the back. Some of them are coming through the cloisters. Some of them are coming, obviously, into the into the um, abbey itself. And a, a sort of wonderfully miscellaneous way of seating them. I noticed a lot of peers, for example, sitting in the nave. In the, the last one, they would have been in either of those two transepts or lanterns. And they were all dressed in red velvet and ermine yes. before. And yes, of, I mean, of again, none of that. miscellany of, of outfits, you could say, because uh, there are ladies wearing hats. That would not have happened in 1953. Lounge suits, but lots of wonderful costumes and... and as I said before, we had this fantastic procession of, of heralds, so you know, it will be, there'll be a very strong medieval element as well. It'll look pretty good. We keep being told it's a slimmed down version of 1953. I don't think, as you said before, <laughs> I don't think anyone slim. watching <laughs> thinks it'll be that slim. Uh, right. We've got an arrival uh, here now who could be, possibly, uh, the first lady of the United States. That's just a wild guess from me, looking at the vehicles arriving here. But very heavyweight, uh, secure vehicles. Uh, the was Beast a... is the presidential limousine, yes. isn't it? I don't... There was a wild guess, but, um, but the, all, all the uh, various representatives and heads of state... Of course, we know that Joe Biden is not coming. He has sent his wife, the first uh, lady here, to uh, represent the US. All blacked-out windows. 
It's, uh, we do have a fantastic vantage point here, actually. All of our ITV News cameras are able to pick up very well. Uh, and it is, it is indeed Jill Biden. There she is, the First Lady of the United States, I think. Uh, yes, and that's, right? her grand, yes. that's her granddaughter with her. So uh, there we are, they're there arriving. And there they go. And uh, they have set up this uh, waterproof walkway so that no one, it really important, is going to get wet today, I guess. Uh, which is an important part of the planning. <laughs> and um, I like what Bill was saying earlier. There is a wet weather plan for the guests, which is to keep them dry. And there's a wet weather plan for the military, which is get wet. And the rest of us too. Nice and dry in the, in the Buckingham Palace, though, studio. <laughs> Tom and Julie. So one of the first uh, sights uh, we've caught this morning of the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, an onerous duty he has indeed uh, a little later uh, performing the ceremony uh, that will unfold uh, after 11 o'clock. Uh, we'll just stay with these images of the First Lady as she arrives at uh, Westminster Abbey. What a collection of dignitaries uh, will unfold before us. We're going to see uh, heads of state, of course, members of foreign royal families too, making their way through the nave, uh, where those who've been invited will watch the, the central parts of the ceremony on some screens within the abbey itself. You can see them there uh, at the great nave. Let's just take in some of these sights and sounds from within the abbey. <laughs> 